Tom joined the Getty in 2007, but before that post, he was a conservation scientist and painting conservators for the Tate Gallery in London, and he was there for 14 years. He, his training, his original training, is as a chemist, and he has a PhD in chemistry from the University of London, but he also has certification in conservation from the Courthold Institute of Art, which is also um, London-based. So kind of combining the best of both worlds for the role that he now holds. Um, and I could, go, um, I could go on with other um, deep remarks to convince you about his astounding expertise and experience. I think it's important to also acknowledge that we have two real Miro heroes in the audience, and that is Marianne Russell Marty and Bob Marty, who's, who are seated at the side over here, who are the people who are actually going to do this painstaking conservation work. And we, we really, um, th that Tom came um, and our second conservator, Martin Radecki, and essentially at the, at the end of their analysis and all our conversations said, well, Bob and Marianne, you really have figured this out. We, we give unqualified endorsement. So um, we just really are so heartened by your professionalism and your commitment to helping us save this work. And with that, I need to turn to a um, much beloved speaker here at the Ulrich. Um, he's part of a dynamic duo, I would say, but we're going to have the one part of the dynamic duo, and that is our inspired and inspiring leader, President Don Beggs. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, Tom, uh, when I listen to your credentials, no wonder I ask you the question. I don't understand why they started at the bottom rather than the top. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's the level we're dealing with. But, uh, but we are pleased and honored to have you here. That it's very special for us uh, to have a person with your experience uh, giving advice, uh, giving credentials for us in terms that are important. But, this is very important to us. This masterpiece has been our priority in terms of capital priority both last year and this year. And I think that, I hope that conveys to you this is important to us. And in a time period where people question the arts and so forth, uh, uh, we're committed to this activity. But I'd also like to share with you a little background on this because when the, when the museum had been determined to be built, then President Clark Allberg and the museum director, Martin Bush, so we've got to have something special. And in having something special, they made the decision that they would get a mural from, from a very capable person. <laughs> Me talking about capable. Uh, the first person they asked was Picasso. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, that's a leader. That was a leader. But more importantly, that was the caliber we were looking for. But his schedule did not permit him to take on this project. And so then, uh, with a little further study, they made the decision to, uh, to contact Moreau, who was intrigued by this and came and looked to see what we had and said, yes, I will do that. And in the process of doing that, we got ourselves an excellent, unique piece of work that we're enormously proud of, not only at this university, but in this city. And it's something that uh, I, I had to see a postcard to see the picture before the Moreau was put up. And, and what an addition that this, this has been for us, something we're immensely proud of, but it represents quality and excellence. And we may not be the largest university in the world, but what we're trying to do is be good at what we do. And excellence is critical for us in terms of what we do for our students, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. So we take great pride in this, and, and with Shirley and I living nearby, for the rest of you, you'd be amazed at how many people come by and look at, at, the, at, at the Moreau coming down. I've really been intrigued to see individuals out, people taking pictures. Uh, that's rewarding because that's what we're about from our perspective. 
But anyway, that represents the excellence that we have. And, uh, and then for us to have a person like you to come and give us advice, that adds to that credibility. And so we hope that we're, per we're conveying to you that we take pride in this. We want it done. We want it done right. We think we have the right people doing it right. And we would love to hear you talk about your experience in what is an absolutely unique field that we're all very proud of. Tom, would you please come forward? Thank you very much, Don, very much indeed. And this uh, Alexander Calder Flamingo piece from Chicago, probably one of the iconic images of uh, modern outdoor painted sculpture. Um, and I've, I forget exactly what the event was that this was filmed at. It, it, it came from Google, but it's some major march. Um, and obviously a focal point, extraordinarily vibrant and um, strong work of art. Um, but as has been mentioned, and as you all know, um, when you place art outdoors, all the things that museums and museum conservators insist on, like low light levels and nice cool temperature and humidity can't fluctuate, obviously doesn't really happen. Um, and you chuck into that sort of pollution and graffiti and vandalism, um, and uh, an outdoor work of art uh, has to put up with an awful lot. So um, when you look at this piece a little bit more closely, and I, I was very fortunate um, to go and visit this piece a couple of years back, um, again, one of these sort of um, advisory group things, but there's been no follow-up since, so I can't actually say, don't know exactly what's happening with, with this piece now, but um, the piece, I think, is undergoing some uh, major restoration. Uh, when you look more closely, the sort of beautiful, painted, pristine surface is uh, deteriorating. A lot of the time, it's not the paint itself, it's the metal beneath it, the substrate that starts to rust in this case. Um, but uh, the slide on the, um, well, both slides, you can probably see paint loss starting to happen. Um, and when you have something this size, um, structural considerations suddenly become quite important in terms of the safety of your public. Um, and, but it's no easy undertaking, as of often very, very expensive uh, and, and long-term uh, uh, treatments. Um, just a couple more. I'm just going to flash up a few examples of outdoor painted sculpture and then get onto this Getty slide and then talk a bit about the work that we've uh, been doing in this area. Um, a couple more images uh, from various sculpture parks uh, around the, the US. On the left is a Liebman from a Seattle um, a sculpture park. On the right, um, an Oldenburg piece in Miami. Um, the, I don't know how well this shows up on the, on the slide, but, but the Liebman, uh, where Seattle, obviously, it rains an awful lot. Uh, we had a lot of sort of, I can't see from this angle, but I think they're there. So the drip marks the water, the, the paint starts to fade, uh, the metal starts to corrode. Um, the Oldenburg uh, in Miami is very humid and tropical climate sometimes. Actually, it's holding up rather well, but you might be able to see here it makes the most perfect skateboard ramp, uh, which you, you, kind of, you sometimes have to wonder, did you not think about that when? <laughs> Isn't it not so obvious that this is going to happen? Um, it, more extreme, this was, a, um, I believe, a, a, a Beverly Pepper sculpture taken apart. I can't actually, to my shame, I was trying to get the, all the artists on the slides today, and I can't remember this is Beverly Pepper or not, but certainly um, it, it's a segment of a, an outdoor sculpture that's been dis, dismantled and taken apart for a, a major treatment, um, and it shows a really quite extreme levels of damage that can happen. Um, this piece is hollow, and water had got inside, and there's huge amounts of rust, and so the piece is structurally very damaged. Uh, the painted surface itself, this, this was, a, it's in a, I think the University of Miami's campus, um, a lot of scratches, a lot of scrapes, um, you know, People often interact with art, and when it's outdoor public art, um, there's definitely a, a real draw to climb on these things. Um, and just another um, of these sculptures that I saw in this Miami studio, which has been taken apart the inside, showing extreme rust. So the, these, these um, sculptures need quite extreme treatments. Uh, often the metal can be salvaged, but um, al almost always at the expense of the bit you see, which is the, the painted surface. Um, I'm not going to spend really any time on murals, but I just have this slide. Um, our, our project at the GCI on outdoor painted surfaces, we're calling it that because it includes sculpture and, and murals, where we see very, very extreme deterioration. Um, it's often actually paints, paints not intended at all for out, outdoor use. Uh, these artists often use artist quality acrylic paints, and certainly in Los Angeles with a very, very strong light levels. Um, and extreme forms of tagging and graffiti that, that goes on in this quite extraordinary uh, situation there at the moment where 
um, I think I'm right in saying that for a couple of instances where graffitis were tagged and the city painted out the graffiti, that the city was then sued by the artist for ruining their artwork. And, and, and what it means now is, is, is that taggers just go for the murals and, and leave the blank wall to the right um, where the tags will be painted over straight away. So um, there's a lot of, you know, difficult and weird conversations going on about how best to sort of tackle that problem. Um, the mural on the, on, on, on the left, you can hardly see now, Isle of California, it was a really iconic mural from Lo Los Angeles, um, and it's just south-facing. Um, the, these earthquake uh, retrofitted um, pieces of steel were added later, which doesn't help either. Um, but it's, it's, it's very hard to see how you can really um, keep works of art like, 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 like this uh, looking as they were intended. Okay, so here's my Getty Trust diagram, and uh, the, the, I just want to kind of describe very quickly what it is that I do and, and where I work, because it, it is a very unusual situation. And the first thing to point out um, is that I do not work for the Museum Conservation Department. Uh, the museum has the, a fantastic conservation department. They, they look after the Getty Collection as any conservation department of a major museum would do. Um, the GCI, the Getty Conservation Institute, as I mentioned at the start, is one of four programs, the museum being one, the research institute being the second, and the Getty Foundation, which I know people often want to get to know those people because that's the bit that gives out the money. Um, we're all equal billing, uh, we're different sizes, but the GCI, um, as uh, Patricia did mention, we are set up to our kind of our stock phrase that's on our website to work internationally to advance conservation practice, and, and that is the key. Uh, it, the visual arts are very broadly interpreted. We have projects in uh, cave paintings in Mogao in China, to King Tutankhamun's tomb, to collections, to architectural um, sites, um, archaeological sites too. So we have a very, very broad uh, mandate, and obviously we can't do everything, so we are forced to sort of focus on certain areas um, and even though the Getty Museum has almost no modern contemporary art in its collection, there's a fairly decent photographic collection developing, one or two pieces of outdoor sculpture, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. But apart from that, it stops at 1897. The collection stops dramatically. It was in Getty's will. So despite this beautiful Richard Meyer building where contemporary art looks fantastic, um, there is none in, in the collection. However, um, the conservation profession um, find any conservator, I'm guessing, any conservator, and ask them, you know, what are the real needs? Where, where do you need more in, in information help? And the vast majority will say contemporary art. There are just so many issues going on that we're struggling with as a profession. And it's very hard to see how museums and individual conservators can really tackle some of these things. And where the GCR really steps in is that we can start to develop something a bit more structured and bring in lots of um, colleagues um, and try and, I mean, not necessarily lead entirely, but definitely offer some leadership. O often it's, it's pulling people, often it's pushing people. Um, and really that was, that was my mandate, to develop something to do with modern and contemporary art. And so it is the most extraordinary job uh, to be leading up. So this piece on the right is Roy Lichtenstein's uh, Three Brushstrokes, and I'm going to spend a lot of my talk talking about this piece just because a fairly major treatment happened uh, at the museum that we were very much involved with in trying to de develop some understanding of the conservation needs of, of contemporary art. Um, it's not the only thing I'm going to be talking about, but I've just flashed it up here to start with. Um, and some of the, um, the issues why co modern and contemporary art uh, conservation throws up additional issues to traditional art. Um, some of these you will know, uh, but maybe not all of them, and some of them you just need to think about a little bit. Um, but he, and these are not the only five. Um, there are many, many more, but these are the five that seem to come up re re uh, repeatedly. The first is that there's this enormous range of new materials. You know, gone are the days where it was an oil painting or a marble sculpture or bronze or print or drawing. Um, pretty much every material out there has been used by some artists. And it's, you know, you often get asked these questions, what is the strangest material that an artist has ever used? Really, it's anything you can think of. I mean, it's probably a more interesting question to try and find a material, any material, that's never been used by an artist. Um, it really is anything goes. Um, and for each of these materials, you know, what a conservator really wants to know is understand its properties, how it behaves, how it functions, how it changes with age, uh, if you're trying to clean it or glue bits back down, you want to know how each of those treatments um, will, will take to these new, new materials. Um, and to give you some idea of the sort of extent of this problem, um, with oil paints, I'm, I'm a painting conservator, so I grew up sort of 
not grew up, but in, in my later years, um, learned a lot about oil paint on canvas. Um, and it's probably something about 30 or 40 years of fairly intense, for our you know, small field, but fairly intense research into oil paints on canvases, how they behave, in addition to the sort of 500 or so, depending on where you assign the invention of oil paint, about 500 years of experience, of artist experience, people sort of handing down ideas through apprenticeships and through studios. And still, really, we struggle with a lot of oil on painting conservation issues. I and mean, there's some very established techniques, but really, often, we get stumped still. So given all that research and knowledge on one sort of system, oil on canvas, we then have to think about how we're going to transfer that to this sort of infinite number of new materials, which, of course, is just impossible. So therefore, we have to start making choices and, and prioritizing, and, and that's where we're trying to come in. Um, many of these materials um, are inherently unstable or fragile. Now, not all of them. Some are very, very stable ma materials, but um, the sort of the, the headlines that contemporary art gets, and often it's the point of what an artist is trying to do, is to do with things uh, change, and they're very un unstable. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. Um, and it's not really the same issue, but we often link these together that in many sort of modern technologies, um, these things will become obsolete. The, the, the technology will stop existing and an art form that relied on a certain sort of platform or Macintosh or video projector um, can no longer be shown in, in that format. Um, there's also a very low tolerance to, to age and damage in, in works of art. Um, and it's particularly problematic, I think, with art that's supposed to be very pristine looking. And I've got some great examples of that later. Um, and with an artist still alive, or an estate still alive, and the concept of an artwork becomes so important, not just the materials, that the look of the thing, there's this sort of need to hang on to how the piece was, how it looked when it was first made. Um, and the Liechtenstein is quite a good example of that when we're seeing where the, where the need to repaint this is primarily based on, it wasn't entirely, but primarily based on an aesthetic consideration that, uh, that the paint was not looking the way it should have done when it was first made. Um, conservation treatments, um, and where the, the area really why I've been so interested and excited in, in the project here with the Miro, is that, um, and I was having a little bit of discussion with Patricia last night about this, um, when I was getting out allergies, but they're not here tonight, which is, which is wonderful. I, was, I, I kind of wasn't crying. It was, um, is that a lot of, because of these sort of uncertainties and, and this lack of experience with these new materials of how they're going to age and how a treatment might then um, end up 50 years down, down the line, because a lot of the times conservation treatments are quite experimental, and it's only having seen how they sort of really pan out uh, do we have confidence in, in actually using them more. Uh, so with modern art, we just don't have this experience. And because of that, unfortunately, what happens a lot is, is conservators, I'm going to use a very general term with conservators now. I'm, I'm one of them, so I can say this. It's not true of everybody, of course. But there's so much time spent documenting now, which is a very, very important part of conservation. But if it's at the expense of not sort of trying things out and being a little bit experimental to see what's going to happen, fewer and fewer works of art get treated, so fewer and fewer works will, we will have 20, 30 years down the line to base decisions on whether that was successful or, or not. So we're starting to see quite a sort of, not a vicious circle, but something's happening where someone has to sort of step in, the, the, the sort of profession I think has to get a little bit more active. And what, to get back to the Miro, the fact that this is a treatment and it's, it's very um, to be supported and sometimes these treatments have to happen um, and people make their best guesses and I think what's happening is wonderful. Um, but there's always uncertainties. It's just, it's just part of the deal. And finally, and I've touched on this slightly, um, this sort of more ethical dilemma that's often posed when an artist, especially if they're still alive, but often happens sort of soon after their death if there's an active estate or or family or something, um, where the, this idea of the artist's intent, the concept, the idea being so much stronger than the actual materials, whereas in traditional art, we tend to value the actual original materials far more highly than um, concept, and that at some point, these sort of, the values do, do change. But in contemporary art, we're really in the very sort of recent lifetime of, a, of, a, of an artwork. So an artist's voice is a very strong one, and there are many times when artists want something done or not done, and it's very difficult to go against that word, that opinion, where it may be not what sort of the gut feeling is saying or thinking about the long-term uh, issues are. So it, it, it is a, a problem. Um, it makes for fantastic dis discussions and presentations, and I hope to show a few examples of that um, a little bit uh, later in the, in the talk. I've, I've just got a few um, slides here, and none of these actually are public arts, 
or outdoor art, but there, there's, there are slides I use the whole time to show some of these dilemmas, and I, and I hope they'll help if, if, if these things weren't clear or, already. In terms of modern materials being, can be very unstable, uh, one of the very sort of classic uh, examples used is the early plastics, the cellulose nitrate acetates. You know, the problem there were in the early cinematic films with the, the films going to powder. Um, but Garbo, in this case, Antoine Pevsner, made wide use of these plastics. They were modern materials. They were thought to be very stable. Um, on the left is a photograph of the, uh, this piece taken in, in 1956. The piece comes from 1927. Um, and on the right are two images when I saw the piece uh, at the Phillips Collection in Washington um, last year. The piece has gone yellow, opaque. It's breaking to, uh, apart. Fairly extreme instability. And to be honest, there's not a lot you can really do in this situation other than do th think about things like replicas and, and sort of um, other less conventional approaches. Um, I mentioned obsolescence. One of the f really quite interesting projects that I'm just starting up at, at the GCI is to do with Dan Flavin, just as an example of a very influential artist who's using a technology that his art relies on, the fluorescent tube. Um, and, the, you know, you can get white fluorescent tubes in the thick diameter that, that he preferred still. Uh, the colored tubes are now entirely custom made. And in fact, if you go to the Dan Flavin studio where the conservation, inverted common, happens, what you actually see is just basically um, stockpiles of all the colored tubes. They're, they're made by one manufacturer. Um, and obviously, as we go on, that one manufacturer may just decide it's just not worth doing it. The, the, the other tubes will, be, will, will become more difficult. At some point, um, the fluorescent tube will cease to be. So, that, so that there's a kind of quite, and he's such a high profile artist, that there's a lot of thinking going on about how to deal with that. Do you just let it go and die and whatever? That was the time of the, the 20th century and early 21st century. Do you try and come up with some other system that has a, will, no, will not look like a fluorescent tube, but somehow in, in encapsulates the essence of this work? You're trying to define what is it actually about a Dan Flavin work that's so impressive. It's not just the fixtures and the, and the physical tube and the color it gives. It's the sort of everything around the room and how it in, interacts. So there's, but there's a lot of discussion going about how, to, how the profession can deal with that. Um, one of the artists that I'll get back to at the end of my talk, um, a Southern California artist, Dwayne Valentine, who made these beautiful large-scale polished polyester circles. This is a, a six-foot diameter circle um, where they're, they're polished to such perfection that really anything that's on the surface, a single scratch, um, not kills it, but severely de you know, gets in the way of enjoying the piece. The whole idea is your eye can't quite make out um, this, this quote, which you're probably all reading, which I won't read, um, is from a, um, a contemporary of his, Helen Pashkin, who made very, very similar um, sort of works, the Finnish fetish artist. Um, so it just means that, you know, with traditional art where we deal with an oil paint cracking or something getting slightly yellow or bits missing from a sculpture, with a lot of contemporary art, at the moment that's not on the table. They have to be kept looking like this. Um, and that involves some fairly invasive conservation treatments at some point. In the case of a scratch on this piece, the whole scratch in the air around it would have to be re-sanded so the scratch comes out and, 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 and re-polished. So you're having to remove a lot of original surface just to get rid of one scratch. Um, two more of these. Um, the more about the intent and original ma ma materials. A couple of examples. Um, a British um, artist, I know a few of you have met this evening, have been to Tate Britain. Um, this piece on the top, Tony Cragg's Britain as Seen from the North, is often uh, up at the Tate Britain. And it, it's a wonderful piece, actually, where um, everything is found from the River Thames, and it's just debris, and it, it gets stuck on the wall. And his, he, Tony Cragg, gives very clear instructions that if a, a piece deteriorates and, and there's sort of all kinds of things that are deter deteriorating quite quickly, then you do not make a replica or, or try and make that piece look the same and stick it back on. You go back to the Thames and you find another piece of debris and the, it doesn't matter if it's completely different shape, color, just that it can't be the same color and same shape as the piece ne next, ne next to it. Now, whether we do that or not, that's one thing, but that's his intent and to him that's the important thing about the work. There's all come from the getting cleaner River Thames. <laughs> and then Sol LeWitt on, on the bottom, this piece from the Allen Museum. I mean, Sol LeWitt made many outdoor painted sculptures where the same issue would actually be uh, true. But um, this piece from the Allen Museum where there's a detail of just one of these, um, however many they are, um, pieces in this in, 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 in installation, the paint's chipping slightly, there are a few scratches. But that was deemed 
severe enough damage to completely strip and, re and repaint the entire piece where the piece has to, it's part of the, the concept of SolidWare that it has to be flawless and you just see the shape. So, you know, for, for many people like myself who come from a traditional painting conservation background, that took quite a bit of getting used to. Um, and then finally, this wonderful, I think, wonderful example from Jean Tangley's uh, museum, this idea of shifting values. Um, I saw this, um, this conservator talk about Tangley uh, last year, and he made a really interesting observation that the early Tangley pieces, uh, it, those of you who don't know Tangley, his pieces often move and make sound and function. They have motors, things hit each other. So they're, they're, they, and they have to function to really, to, well, to function. Um, but the early pieces now, if, 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 if a motor or a part broke, they would no longer replace that. It becomes a sort of a relic, and they just, they really value the, the fact that you have original painted surfaces and, and cut out pieces on this 1955 piece. In the, in the very late work, the 85, this piece absolutely has to function, so anything that breaks, they replace it. And he points out that sort of somewhere about the 1970 mark seems to be the sort of shift from the valuing the function and the concept to this valuing of the more historical authenticity of the work. And I'm sure many other artists, this will happen. They're, at some point, there's, there's going to be this shift, and it's something that I'm very interested in trying to make people more aware that it doesn't matter how good your justification is for doing something to an artwork now, that's not the whole story. That we do have to think in some instances about what will happen uh, in the future. So our outdoor painted sculpture um, project, really it started off quite scientific, dealing with analysis. Um, all the paints being used for outdoor painted sculpture, and there are very, very many, um, certainly trying to understand you know, the best paints to use for an artist or to, to restore with. A lot of it starts with analysis. Um, and I spent a lot of my time at the Tate figuring out best ways of analyzing paints used by uh, painters. In, indoor art, many painters, some indoor sculpture. Um, when, you, when you move to the exterior paint, there's very, very limited knowledge within our conservation profession of what these paints are. It's not to say it doesn't exist elsewhere, but it's actually extremely hard to find people in the industry to tell you things about paints, and it's often, that is not interest, is, is often proprietary information, of course. Um, but to try and understand, you know, what the various forms of polyurethane we use in painting system was very difficult. So we, we have spent a fair amount of time establishing ways of identifying paints. We've got a long way to go. Um, essentially, there are so many new paints, but what we decided to do was try and concentrate on the sort of big name artists and fabricators, so the Corders, the Dubuffets, the, the Souvereaux, um, where they're fairly good documentation and, and we can start to pick up on, on, on the different paint systems used by those artists. Um, but where we're going quite quickly, and what I want to talk to you more about uh, today is the sort of what this means for actual conservation, the, the protocols. Um, and again, like that Solowitz um, indoor sculpture, I was quite shocked when I realized that outdoor painted sculpture, the, the kind of the way it's treated is just to strip and repaint the paint. Essentially, the paint is seen as such a, um, a, a, a coating, a protective coating to the metal or whatever the subject is, that often this sort of, what I was thought the most visual, you know, immediate, the thing you see first, um, was having a far less importance to a, a painting, for, for, uh, for, for example. Um, and I understand entirely why that's necessary. Um, but it just seemed that there was, there was no sort of established protocols in place. And also, as we look more into this, we found that so many times pieces were being painted the, the wrong color. I mean, sometimes extreme wrong colors, but often it's a shade of yellow or shade of red. Um, and that there might have to be some way of sort of documenting um, paint systems for conservators to use uh, in, 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 in the future. And we, for this, we, we are looking at a number of artists, but I'm talking just about Lichtenstein tonight just because we've done the most amount of work on Liechtenstein, and it's included working very closely with their foundation, um, who've been really open, and therefore it helped to decide, let's work with the <laughs> Liechtenstein Foundation, and not one of the other foundations or states who are less helpful sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and the fact that also the Getty was about to repaint or restore at least um, their uh, sculpture three brushstrokes. So here is the piece. Um, it's three brush strokes from 1984, and it's, for those of you who haven't been to the Getty, here it is. And those of you who are coming, I know some of you are coming early next, next year, come and see this piece. It's wonderful. Um, when we started doing our projects and talking to the museum, conservators who were thinking about what to do with this piece, they, they were picking up on sort of fairly typical problems with outdoor painted sculpture. 
the metal was corroding, starting to corrode, so you get these sort of pustules occurring. Some of the coatings were going whitish and blanched or peeling off. There were some areas of scratching and cracking. So the, it, was, it was deemed to be not enough in itself to warrant a complete repaint, but they were starting to think about it. Um, then as they were digging a bit further, they found that, in fact, our, our sculpture was one of two that were made, uh, the other one being in a private collection in Miami, so very non-public art. Um, and as you can probably see, that, that's the piece on the left uh, where the blue and red colors have been switched uh, in, in, the, in the two um, sculptures. But the, the yellow in particular is a very, very pale yellow in the Miami piece. And in our one, it was a quite a bright yellow. Um, and Lichtenstein, the people who knew Lichtenstein said they found the yellow very, very strange. Um, and this lighter yellow seemed far more likely. And indeed, as they continued, they, they were able to find that there was an actual maquette that was owned by still owned by the Lichtenstein Foundation. Uh, it, it's a sort of a, a, a two-foot-high uh, painted bronze ma ma maquette where the, where the colors show this light, uh, light, lighter yellow very, very clearly. Um, and it's not just the color, it's often the, uh, the surface. So uh, on, on the left is, is, it was the, uh, the condition of the Getty's brush strokes with this sort of very brushed-on surface. And on the right, the, the Miami piece, very, very smooth and most likely sprayed on. As they um, looked a bit more closely and at some of the losses and edges of, of the sculpture, you could start to see quite clearly, actually, that there was another color beneath, and it's most clear in the, in the yellow, perhaps, about there. Um, you see this lighter yellow beneath the yellow, and it, it, it seemed to be become more and more likely that uh, the paint had been repainted, this, well, we knew it had been repainted, but perhaps it hadn't been stripped and repainted, that there were some remnants of the original colors beneath, um, but clearly the repaint was, was a very different color. The same was true of the red, but it wasn't quite as extreme. Um, I'm going to come back to these cross-sections. These are samples that um, often scientists take. It's a small fraction of the paint film taken from the work of art, um, embedded in a resin, turned on its side, and ground down. So you see the layer system. So from top to bottom, you're seeing the visible layers at the top all the way down. And essentially, it became quite clear that, yes, indeed, in these samples, this was the original yellow and the original red, and above it was, was, was the repaint. So we didn't exactly know what layer corresponded to which at this point, but we certainly knew that there was paint uh, beneath the overpaint. Um, and quite typically, um, there was documentation. So often what happens is there's instructions about repainting. So in this case, there was a letter from Lichtenstein to the conservator in the mid-90s, um, I don't know how well you can read this, but basically it, it lists out very clearly the primer to use, the under coats to use, the first and ground coat, second coat, and then this third and fourth coat, which is the, which is the upper one. Um, a cup, which, which is great to have this on, on, on record, and presumably this for many people will think, well, this is fine because we've got leaks and signs instructions and we'll just match the paint and it'll be fine. Um, in fact, what happens is that um, these product codes um, that describe the actual color uh, can often, uh, they, they can be discontinued completely. Uh, you know, pigments change the whole time, so often manufacturers will try and match those colors, but often those colors will behave differently, maybe more transparent or something, or they'll discontinue them completely. Um, and secondly, the, um, so this is the primer, the ground, the sort of priming colors, the, the under colors. This is, this is the top coat where essentially he was asking, um, he made these by mixing magna paints, which is an artist's acrylic paints, uh, that he used for all his paintings, so this is where the, the palette came from, mixed in with this polyurethane uh, varnish. Um, but there's no indication of proportion, which would affect transparency, gloss, the amount of brush strokes. So actually, it's quite clear to see why um, the overpaint was inaccurate. It's very open to error, really. Um, so part of our, when we started joining, the, this is Julie Wolf on, on the right, the Getty Museum conservator, with James de Pasquale, who is Lichtenstein's assistant. Um, Lichtenstein died in 97, so he's been um, dead for quite a while, but Pasquale is still around, and actually James de Pasquale painted most of the sculptures himself, um, so he was a great re resource to have. This is when we first found the maquette, actually, where we could see exactly uh, the sort of colors tying in with what we thought we were seeing with the analysis. Um, dug a bit deeper for Lichtenstein's um, indoor paints, paintings. There is an established protocol. There are swatches that the foundation owns, and these are them on the top right and the, and the bottom right. 
So colors can be matched to all the paints that he was using. Um, often, um, he, when he died, all of these sort of pre-mixed paints were left, so they're there for, for a comparison. But nothing like that for the outdoor sculpture. Um, and as we dug further, we found that actually there were quite, there were interestingly two schemes of painting his sculpture. The first came straight from the paintings, and it's a, it was the, the, the scheme that we had in our, our letter from Lichtenstein, this idea of, of, of the sort of DuPont Imron colors first, and then the Magna mixed in with the varnish on top. Um, and most of those sculptures are now, uh, have been repainted, and we think there's only a single sculpture left, um, and it's this one in a, in a, in a Paris um, uh, shopping center, and actually therefore indoors, which has, this exist, has the original uh, paint surface, very, very brushed on, um, quite matte um, paint system. Um, the, uh, the later sculptures were actually far more industrial with, 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 with a paint called All Grip. It's, it's a very, very strong boat paint, and it's sprayed on, and th this is a, a later piece. Um, so a much more sort of simple system to follow, and interest or, interestingly, or to make things more complicated, depending on how you look at things, um, when Lichtenstein, when the early pieces came back to Lichtenstein for conservation, he decided to repaint them in this later system. So it's a very tricky thing about where you place. Do you go back to where the piece was made or what he felt at the time of his death or, what, what, or whatever? But because the early system is far less um, robust, it does deteriorate more quickly. Um, and because it's easier to match this later system, most of the pieces have been repainted in this system. Um, but what we wanted to do was therefore, so, so the later system we, we can document fine. What we wanted to do was actually try and figure out a way of documenting the early system and have that sort of standard palette so it can be used for whoever wants to go back to this, uh, this initial palette. Um, and I do accept that this is a huge amount of work <laughs> that went into the conservation of a single work of art that may, perhaps only the Getty could afford to do. But the, but the point of it was actually to make it available to the field that anyone with a Lichtenstein um, outdoor sculpture can access this information and understand um, a little bit better. And this was James mixing up some of these sort of early acrylic paints with the polyurethane to essentially uh, provide us with this, which is the sort of palette where each of the colors that were used on these outdoor sculptures uh, were provided to us. Um, and they have a very a thin color of, I mean, the, the whole thing is covered with this um, initial paint, but you can see a bit of it just showing through here, and then the upper coat you see on most of the swatch. Um, these three colors being the three, we had bigger ones because they're the ones that we want for our three brush strokes. So we, we did that. we've then used this an awful lot to try and measure the color and put numbers to it so people can actually use it to mix up their own colors. We, we found, unfortunately, that it's quite hard to do that. It's quite easy to, to quant quantify color, but very hard to quantify surface sort of brush strokes, very hard when you have a painting that's a paint that's slightly transparent. Um, so we're actually relying much more on these physical paint swatches and the, the thought now is to have, a, have a, a few more batches made up so they can be stored in different locations. Um, and just to go back to these, uh, these two cross sections, they, we, we then figured out exactly what, what, what we were seeing. So these, these bottom two layers, there is a slight um, uh, you know, boundary separation here, yeah, boundary here. Two layers of this DuPont industrial car paint. Then this sort of handmade artist magna paint with polyurethane, which is why it looks so swirly, because it was just mixed up and not very well. The original varnish, and then this is the repaint on top with actually a varnish on top of that. Um, and the yellow is very similar. Uh, you can see that the original yellow is this much paler color. And a rather nice little thing we found was this little red spot here, which showed us that the red was resprayed before the yellow, because a little splatter from the red paint landed on, on this yellow before it was re repainted over the top. Um, and the treatment um, was uh, as such. Um, that, uh, and this is, this is where the, the museum, the GCI, we, we sort of clashed a little bit. The, 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 the sort of museum felt that there was enough justification. Uh, well, certainly we agreed to, to repaint it. They wanted to go back to this original um, system to get this original surface, knowing full well that it may, be, it may deteriorate more quickly, but we felt it was a really good opportunity with James de Pasquale around to help repaint this in that way. Um, where we disagreed slightly was that they, they felt that to get the proper adhesion, and I, I mean, they're right in their, in their argument, um, 
they would have to re they have to strip the whole piece back to the metal and get the proper prime and all that kind of stuff. And I think we just felt what a shame we couldn't keep a little bit of that original paint because it was there beneath. Um, and we there, we might have reached a compromise, but normal things got in the way and had to be done quickly and blah blah. blah. So. It was done. However, they did spend a lot of time documenting the original paint system. Um, so in, in particular, when they did some little um, sort of ex excavations to actually see the original paint system, um, they were able to get a very good I idea of the color, the level of the brush strokes. Um, you can see that it was pretty da it was damaged, which is why the piece needed repainting in, in the first place. So it had been highly unlikely to remove the late overpaint to get back to the original. Um, but still, there was some discussion whether you could leave a little square somewhere, you know, hidden away at the top, just just, just for historical um, interest. And then this and this this was James coming back to, to, to repaint the piece. Now at this point, I was going to show a video, but I I'm not going to because I've I've spoken too long. Because I do want to um, go on a little bit um, and finish off, in fact, and then, and then I will take question with my Wichita story, which I've spoken to a lot of you about and said I'm going to talk about it tonight, so I can't tell you now. Um, <laughs> But going back to this artist, Southern California artist, Dwayne Valentine, who I'd been spending a lot of time with and working on, when I came to um, visit the mural last year and I was having lunch with Patricia and she was asking me what I was doing, I'm, I'm working on this artist and she said, I don't think I've, I know his work. Can you explain it? Just, 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 can you describe it? Well, sure, he, he works with his polyester resin and it's, it's highly sanded and polished and he makes these beautiful circles and slabs. And it was part of this big Los Angeles initiative called Pacific Standard Time, which just opened this last weekend and runs for about four or five months in LA, where huge numbers of art institutions are all doing exhibitions about the art of Los Angeles post-World War II. So it's a really amazing event that's just, just happened. We were doing a, a small project, a small exhibition on this guy, Dwayne Valentine. Um, and he made many of these, um, these are a six foot, where is he? Six foot diameter circles here. This is a six-foot diameter circle here. But there was a rumor that he, well, we knew he had made three eight-foot circles. And this is him inside one of the eight-foot circle molds. But nobody knew where they were. They were, they, they were, they were lost. And then Patricia muttered the immortal words, I think I've seen one of those in the Bank of America lobby in downtown Wichita. <laughs> and it was kind of, OK. So I think we actually went to visit the Frank Lloyd Wright House first on this trip, and I've never been less interested in Frank Lloyd Wright House. It was just, just, <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Um, and we got to the lobby, and there it was. There's the eight-foot circle, and it was. And it, so anyone that drives past, that's what we did last night. There's there's a big gap here now. This beautiful atrium with the Calder um, uh, mobile up 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 here, and so we it was found, um, and in fact. If you come to LA, there it is now in um, the main exhibition at, at, at the Getty, looking at many of these artists from, from this period. It, it was restored, it was sanded, repolished for this. Um, this was not the GCI's uh, project, but it, it looks absolutely stunning. Um, and I just have three more slides to finish off with. The, the, I just wanted to do a little plug for, I, I'm a researcher, conservation scientist. I never curate an exhibition, but I have just created an exhibition. So I'm, I'm not gonna come here and just not talk about it. Um, this, this is another, this is the piece we were working on with Dwayne. Uh, it was a piece called um, Grey Column, and it's the largest piece he ever made in this polyester resin. It's, it's 12 feet high, 8 foot wide, and highly polished. Uh, again, um, we actually run a bit longer, so anyone coming to CAA in Los Angeles in February, the exhibition will be open, so I hope many of you can come up and see it. Um, it, was, it was a really interesting story of, um, Dwayne, Dwayne had to actually invent this new resin to allow him to, cast such enormous works of art. The, the, the resins around um, could only be cast in sort of a foot cubes. Uh, anything more than that, the, the, the heat released during the, the curing process of the resin would cause the resin to crack. So, but he, he got to work and met some people and, and you know, went into, into a sort of dark hole somewhere and played with the sort of formulation and, and essentially came up with a formulation that would allow him to cast these enormous pieces. So it's a sort of fantastic you know, art meets science, meet technique, meet technology sort of story, with the artist pushing for a new material. Um, he made two of these gray columns, but the architect, in fact, ironically or coincidentally, the same architect as the Bank of America lobby building, uh, SOM, um, they lowered the ceilings to this uh, corporate uh, boardroom of the backs of Travanol building in Deerfield, Illinois. Um, and so the 12-foot high pieces would not fit. The ceilings were like 11 feet. 
Um, so Duane put them on this, he had two of them and, and installed them on their sides. It was called two gray walls, walls being the sort of landscape orientation, column being the, the, the uh, portrait. He, he did acquire them back, so when we found them, they were in, the, in this sort of container back in his studio in Gardena. Um, and the, the story behind this piece is really about the story behind it, so how the piece was made, this idea he had to make a new resin. We discuss a lot of these conservation implications in particular, where it's a really good example of an original surface which has changed since the 1970s when it was made. The piece was very flat originally, but the resin has moved and it's now sort of slightly rippled and, and ridged. Um, and the question, Duane wanted it re-sanded and re-polished back to the original appearance as you know, is often the case with living artists. And we um, respected that um, view, but we wanted to actually you know, make some of these issues, uh, throw them out there to the, to the public. So we convinced him, it took a lot of convincing, and I shan't go into how we convinced him, um, but we convinced him to allow us to show the piece without anything done to it, um, not saying it should never be resanded, but at least by not sanding it, all the options are still open to us and to him. He still owns the piece, so we, so we don't know what happens. But we wanted to kind of show some of these issues that make such a big impact on an artwork um, that most people have no idea actually go on behind the scenes, and they're really very difficult decisions to, to actually make. And then finally, of course, was the fact that it was the first time that the piece had ever been seen upright, so Duane had never seen this piece upright, just in his mind, so it was a lovely moment when, um, when he came up. And I'm, I'm just going to leave this up there. This is our catalogue. I've left a, a copy with um, Patricia. I couldn't quite bring 80 copies, um, but she has one to look at, so, and I'll be happy to, to, to give you details of how, how, how to get it. Um, that's 45 minutes. I think, I think I will say thank you so much for your attention.